I grew up fishing the deep lakes in North Texas, where structure meant a 15-foot drop-off and cover meant acres of flooded timber and rocks. If an angler could figure out all the variables at play and determine where in the lake the intersection of those variables occurred, he would have a good shot at catching his target fish. That's how I'd spend my summers, exploring lakes and trying to piece the puzzle together. You can imagine then the confusion and frustration I felt when I moved to the Texas coast and started inshore fishing. Where was the structure? Where was the cover? How could I possibly catch something like a redfish in such a shallow and featureless environment? And now there were two completely foreign variables at play, the wind and the tide. Today I'd like to record the video for you that I wish I had eight years ago when I first started inshore fishing. I still have got a lot to learn about this unique fishery, but I've managed to piece a few things together over the years. I'd like to share with you my workflow for kayak fishing the Texas coast. Now in this video I'd like to talk about four things. I'd like to talk about structure and cover, accessibility, what gear to use, and the tide and the winds. The first thing that I'd like to talk about is structure and cover. So structure refers to the bathymetric features of the water body. The average depth of the Texas estuary is six feet. Because of this, structure is much more subtle than what you might find in a lake. The expansive flat that gently drops off into a deep pool, or a channel that abruptly cuts through shallow water. Points, islands, and reefs are all examples of structure. Structure dictates how currents move through the bay, and fish use these currents for feeding as they tend to funnel their prey. Cover, on the other hand, refers to things in the water that allow a fish to hide from predators and prey. Things like seagrass, pilings, or sunken objects are all examples of cover. Fish need both structure and cover, preferably both at the same location. These are two variables that I consider first when looking for a place to fish. Let me show you a few examples. At this location, you can see both structure and cover. The structure here are the islands, the deep channel, and the reefs. The cover in this spot is the seagrass, the duck blind, and the mangroves that grow on the edges of the islands. Now if I were to fish this location, I would focus my efforts on the cuts that drain this island, the edges of the islands where the mangroves are growing, the potholes in the seagrass, and the edges and points of the deep channel. Now when I say potholes in the seagrass, I'm referring to these bald spots in the bed of grass. Predatory fish will hang out on the edges of these potholes in order to ambush their prey as they swim across it. Here, the structure is not quite as obvious. It exists in the subtle changes in depth here and here. You can tell that the water is deeper by its darker color and by the absence of seagrass. Deeper channels and holes don't allow for the light penetration that seagrass requires for photosynthesis. Cover, on the other hand, is very obvious in the form of grass. Redfish and trout will be hiding along the edges and potholes of the grass. The method I'd use to fish a location that looked like this would be either to drift across it all, casting in the direction of my drift, or to target the edges of the grass, but that might only be possible during clear water conditions. The last example I want to show you seemingly has no structure at all. The shoreline itself offers structure in a sense, but as you move away from it, we see a very gentle slope with no dramatic drop-offs or islands. Even so, a spot like this will still hold game fish. The amount of grass offers plenty of opportunities for ambush predators, and the gentle slope in the water depth offers them the ability to travel easily between shallow and deeper water. Remember, in the bay, a one-foot change in water depth can make all the difference in the world. I'd fish this area by hitting the potholes and edges of the grass along the shore, and then working my way back into deeper water until I find fish. The thing that I love most about kayak fishing is that it requires an angler to really pick apart a relatively small area. Instead of moving across the bay when I can't find any fish, I'm moving over to the next island or oyster reef. Hopefully this has helped you understand the different types of structure and cover that offer the potential for holding fish. Just remember, if you're not catching anything at one location, move to something else and continue this trend until you start catching. Now that you've located an area that you want to fish, the next thing is figuring out where to launch your kayak from. Once again, I use Google Maps for this. 
I first look at the near shorelines to see if there are any pull-offs that people clearly use. I look for worn paths through the grass or parked cars where people are fishing. If I find something, I'll check it out even closer by using Google Street Views. This can be done by going to Google Maps, panning to the area that you're interested in, and then dragging the little guy from the bottom right corner and dropping him on the road. This allows me to see if there are any closed gates or obstacles that might prevent me from using the pull-off. I do want to note that the Google Street View car has not been down most small roads, so if the street doesn't light up blue when you drag the little guy over it, then this feature is not going to work in that location. If I'm unable to find an easy pull-off to launch my kayak from, the next thing that I look for are the nearest boat launches or bridges. Underneath bridges can often be a great spot to launch from and park your vehicle, but boat launches usually offer easier access and safer places to park your vehicle. If you're still struggling to find an access point, you can always search your area for kayak launches using Google Maps. Okay, you found a good spot that offers a variety of structure and cover. You know where you're going to launch your kayak from. Now what kind of fishing rod do you need? I like to use a 7 foot medium to medium heavy rod with a fast tip. You'll want a rod with a good backbone for fighting fish and a fast tip for casting baits further and more accurately. I like to use a 3000 size reel with 10 pound braid and a 20 pound fluorocarbon leader. My favorite setup is my 7 foot medium falcon rod with a 3000 size pin fierce reel. If you're a beginner angler, I'd recommend fishing with live bait for your first few trips. This will give you greater odds of hooking into something and it will allow you to pattern where the fish are. Now there's lots of different options for live bait. There's shrimp, sea lice, croaker, mud minnows, and much more. You can never go wrong with throwing live shrimp under a popping cork or on the bottom. If you're unfamiliar with popping corks, there's several YouTube videos out there on how to set them up and fish them. I recommend you check them out. There are also plenty of dead bait options, and two of the most popular are dead shrimp and crab. Just hook them onto something like a Carolina rig or a fish finder, cast them out, and let them sink. Now for all you artificial anglers out there, as you know, there's shelves upon shelves of saltwater lures at the tackle shop. 99% of the time, I'm throwing either a down south lure, a gulp mullet, or a mirror lure topwater. I know there's hundreds of other lures out there, but these are what I have the most confidence in. My suggestion to you is find a handful of lures that you have confidence in and stick with them. I believe kayak fishing is much better when you take a minimalist approach anyways. As far as knowing what color to use, I use the rule of thumb that says to throw dark baits in murky water and bright baits in clear water. I like something like a pink shad color in murky water and something like bone diamond or chicken of the sea in clear water. I recently made a video about all the gear that I take out on my kayak. If you're interested in that, then you can click the link up there in the top. The last thing that I want to talk about is the wind and the tide. These two variables can be daunting to someone that is new to the salt water, and rightfully so. Now this video is not the place to dive too deep into it, but I do want to offer some information on the matter so that you can plan your trips accordingly. In short, water movement is key for inshore fishing. Water movement is caused by the incoming or outgoing tide and by the wind. The tide does not move uniformly across the entire bay system. The Texas coast only has a few passes that connect the Gulf of Mexico to the bay. And generally speaking, the further you move away from one of those passes, the less tidal movement will be expected. In areas like that, anglers rely on the wind to drive most of their water movement. The best advice I can give you is to download an app that shows you the major and minor feeding periods. These periods are based on the sunrise and sunset, the phase of the moon, and the tides. If you'd like to know more about the science behind this, you can look up the Soul Lunar Theory. It's actually pretty cool. The app that I use for this is called Fish Angler. It shows a fishing forecast listing the major and minor feeding periods of each day. If you have the flexibility to plan your trips around these feeding periods, then absolutely do it. But if you're like me, you only have a few set times that you're able to get out there and fish. If that's the case, then just get out there and fish. 
You'll learn more from spending time on the water than from anything else. I also like to use an app called WindFinder to see a forecast of the wind conditions. Make a note of the wind speed and direction and use this information to help plan where you're going to fish. In general, unless I can find somewhere that is very well protected from the wind, I won't take my kayak out in winds greater than 15 miles per hour. It just gets too dangerous after that. Well, that's all I have for this video. Keep those four categories in mind when planning your next trip, and hopefully you'll be able to get on some more fish. Thank you all so much for watching. It really does mean a lot. If you enjoyed the video, then please consider clicking that subscribe button below. Y'all have a great week, and I will see you again next Tuesday.